Good morning and okay. welcome everyone for being able to join us for today's webinar, Unemployment Insurance Overview and Strategies to Reducing Those Expenses. Today we have our uh, partner Angie Hansen from Employers Edge. She is the Director of Client Services. Services. She has many years in UI just kind of handling claims and also uh, making sure employers get the best out of the UI, making sure that they know how to keep those costs down, being able be completely familiar with all the aspects of UI. Uh, before we start getting to today's material, there are, there are a couple of housekeeping items I would like to go over. The first is the HRCI training credit. This webinar is worth one HRCI training credit, but in order to receive it, you need to stay with us for at least 80% of today's webinar. Also, you must have signed name this full name this morning. Um, the way we're able to verify your attendance and the way we're able to follow up with you, send you a copy of the presentation, send you your HRCI credit, and send you any of other supporting materials is we match your registration name with the name you used to sign in this morning. If you're not sure if you used your full name or if you have someone else in the room who's joining you in the room, please type that into the chat log. We'll be sure to count you both for today's presentation. We'll make sure you all, everyone gets the credit they deserve for being able to show up. One other thing, you may have noticed that you are on mute for today's presentation. Unfortunately, that's just kind of the way we have to keep it. Um, you just take that one person in the background, just either asking for directions or, you know, a little bit of stats to kind of ruin for everyone. But if you do have any questions, please type them into the chat log. It's just towards the right-hand side. You might have seen a little good morning from us. You can also download today's presentation. Pres ah, <laughs> sorry, morning. Uh, you can also download today's presentation. Just above that child, you'll see a file, Reduced Excessive Unemployment. Go ahead and click that file, hit Download File, and what that's going to do is open up a new tab where you can download today's presentation directly. If this doesn't work for you, again, please type something into the chat log. We'll see if we can find you an alternate link. We will also be sending a copy of this presentation at the end of the day today along with your HRCI training credit. And with that, I think we're ready to hand this over to Angie. Angie. No. Great. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Angie Hansen. I'm the Director of Client Services here at Employers Edge. And uh, we're going to um, just hit you with a lot of information today about unemployment, um, what's going on in the uh, unemployment industry right now. And here's kind of our agenda that we're going to follow this morning. So we're going to talk about financing. How does financing affect you as the employer? Um, the state solvency and due to taxes, what's going on, you know, with borrowing from the federal government as a number of states still are. We'll talk about um, some new legislation that was enacted in all 53 jurisdictions, including Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, um, and that's Section 252. You'll often hear us refer to that. Um, some questions I get asked more, most often is about the base period and how am I charged, um, the flow of the unemployment claim, so that process. What are the states looking for? What can you do to help minimize some of your exposure to unnecessary um, cost? We'll talk a little bit about unemployment hearings. And of course, um, at the very end, um, if we're able to, um, um, I'll go through some of the questions that you may have entered in the chat log. But I will stop periodically and check the chat, chat log to see if you um, have any questions. Um, so I'm hoping, I just got to see an email coming in that says, I can't hear anything. Do I need to click on something? So um, Steve, is there something that, all right, and um, a couple of people said they don't have audio. Uh, you do need to call into the telephone conference. I'm going to go ahead and type that into the chat log. Unfortunately, they can't hear this right now. Uh, there is a number okay. at the very top. Okay, Doc. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to keep talking here. Um, so here's your, um, what are the falsehoods we hear? often in this industry is, and this is from the claimant or the, the former employee, and the former employee may say to you, well, you know, I've paid into the system my whole life, so why not collect benefits? Well, the problem with that statement is the employee does not pay into unemployment. This is a tax that is 100% paid for by the employers, and truly, it is really the employer's only controllable tax they have. All their other taxes, you know, building taxes, property taxes, and things of that nature, they don't have control over. Unemployment, you do. 
And how you control your unemployment taxes is by how well you manage your unemployment claims. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that as we kind of go through the presentation today. So here's your history lesson, everybody. In 1935, FDR signed a writer onto the Social Security Act, which required states to write an unemployment insurance program. And of course, it was created right after the Great Depression, and its purpose was to provide temporary assistance and income to individuals who lose their job through no fault of their own, the lack of work. You would never contest an unemployment claim on someone who falls into that category, and frankly, you wouldn't have any right to. But the philosophy is the employer should not be paying unemployment benefits on an individual who quits without good cause or who has been discharged for misconduct. So you want to contest those types of unemployment claims. Of course, each state has their own requirements and own legislation that's written. So where I may get a favorable decision um, where someone may be denied unemployment in one state, um, in another state, it may be a favorable decision to the claimant. So each state has its own um, unique nuances. Each state also has their own method of determining what your unemployment tax rate is going to be. There's a couple of very popular, if you will, financing methods. There's the reserve ratio system here, and there's what's called a benefit ratio system. I would say all states, but just a handful, maybe four or five states out there, utilize one of those two methods, the reserve ratio or the benefit ratio systems. California, I know most of you on this call today are from California. California utilizes what's called this reserve ratio system. And how, this, how the state determines what your unemployment tax rate is, and think of your account at the EDD as a, a big checking account. So you're paying taxes in. So they're looking at all the taxes you pay in, and they take out the benefit charges paid out. So those are those unemployment checks paid out to the claimants. And they get a figure there, and they divide that figure by your average taxable payroll. And I'm talking about your unemployment taxable payroll, not your gross payroll, and they get a ratio. So here's an example for you guys. So if you paid in $150,000 in taxes and you had $110,000 paid out in benefit charges, that leaves a balance of $40,000 and they divide that by your taxable payroll and they get this ratio of this 0.08%. Then they have charts, if you will, and they go down to their ratio charts and they find out where do you fall on that ratio chart, and that would determine what your tax rate is for the next calendar year. Typically, most states, not all, everybody's a little different, but I will say EDD utilizes um, a fiscal year of a July 1 to a June 30 each year to calculate this um, this ratio, and on av and they utilize a three-year average on to calculate this um, ratio. Some states use a five-year average. So again, everybody, each state's a little different. The negative influence, what's going to impact your rate in the reserve ratio system is if your average annual taxable payroll increases. So believe it or not, if you add more employees, that could have a negative impact, and there is an increase in your benefit charges. So the more people collecting unemployment, then that, that has a negative impact, obviously, on what your potential tax rate could be. Now, the benefit ratio system is just a little bit different, and again, about half the states utilize this um, method of financing. And the difference here is they, um, th these states utilize benefit charges divided by the average taxable payroll gives them the ratio. So here's your example. If your benefit charges were 40000 and your taxable payroll is 500000 you divide that out, 0.8%. Uh, 0.08%, and again, you have this ratio or the table that the states go to. They match you up on that table. That determines what your tax rate is. The negative influence for this rating system is um, your average taxable payroll decreases in this scenario, and there is an increase in benefit charges. In both examples, the negative influence is 
more benefits paid out. So bottom line is if you have more benefits being paid out um, than taxes being paid in, it has a negative influence on your rate for the calendar year. You get a rate notice every year. Typically, you know, it comes in October, November, December, somewhere, you know, January, somewhere around that time frame um, for that calendar year. So even though the states may utilize a fiscal year to determine what your rate is, you pay on a calendar year basis is what your unemployment rate is. Um, um, that's what you, you pay on a calendar year. So just I'm going further into some more examples for you guys. California, um, you pay taxes on the first $7,000 each employee earns in a calendar year. Once the employee has earned $7,000 in the calendar year, you no longer pay taxes on that individual. So essentially the first and second quarter of every year for every employer are typically your high tax uh, quarters where you're paying more into the EDD. So the minimum unemployment tax rate in California is one and a half. The maximum is 6.2. So here's some cost examples. If you're paying at the minimum rate in California, you're paying $105 per employee per calendar year. If you're paying at the maximum rate, that's $434 per employee per calendar year. If you have constant turnover in a position, you start over on this um, taxable wage base. So if you turn over a position three times, that could potentially cost you um, about $1,300 dollars in unemployment tax dollars for that one position. So it is by Social Security number that you pay unemployment taxes, not by position type. So again, there's another cost of turnover um, for unemployment is you know starting over on this taxable wage base and paying those unemployment taxes. Now, I will tell you, this taxable wage base in California is the lowest. I mean, it can't go any lower than 7000 Some states are up there in the high $30,000 range. Colorado, as an example, is around $11,700. That's their taxable wage base. Texas is around 9000 So, again, every state is a little different. I will tell you also that California is 10 billion, that's billion with a B, um, in debt to the federal government um, for their Title 12 loans. A Title 12 loan is there was not enough money left in California EDD to pay benefits, so they had to borrow from the federal government, FUTA, um, to pay benefits out to claimants. And if you're, as you can see on this map, there are a number of red states that are borrowing right now from the federal government. They have to pay back that debt, and they have to pay back that debt with interest. A number of states that are brown, you can see they actually issued bonds to pay off their debt to the federal government. So they had to borrow as well, um, but they issued bonds to pay off the debt. So like in Colorado, the bonds were issued, um, but not only is the, are the employers in Colorado paying an unemployment tax rate, they also have something added on like a solvency fee because they have to pay the interest, you know, to, on those bonds. They have to pay off the bond debt. So um, I don't know, frankly, how California is going to pay off that $10 billion. Something will have to happen. They will have to raise, in my opinion, this taxable wage base. They will have to increase employer taxes. So if you are not managing your rates right now, that could be very very, well, it, it could cost you a lot down the road because something will have to happen. Um, $10 billion in debt, they're the most in debt than any other state out there um, to the federal government. As, and I just wanted to give you an example of the first 10 states here. I just did it in alphabetical order. Um, but if we take a look here at California, we can see um, the trust fund balance in debt is um, just shy of the $10 billion. Um, 
and, they, and they're actually going to borrow, and they have been borrowing from California's Disability Trust Fund to pay the interest payments. They have to at least pay the interest payments, and they are doing that. We can see, like, um, Alabama here has $245 million in surplus, so there's no assessment to the employers. Um, Arizona here, there's a 0.5% uh, assessment out there, even though but um, they have less than six months of benefits out there. So they're getting close to where they don't want to borrow again, so they're um, adding some assessments to make sure that their um, reserve balances are solvent so they have enough money to pay back, um, uh, they have enough money to pay out to, to, the, to the claimants. When you are borrowing from the federal government for two consecutive years, you start losing what we call FUTA credits. So remember that example I gave you that you pay quarterly taxes to the states, but you also pay an annual tax to the federal government, federal unemployment. You pay that tax once a year on January 31st of each year. The taxable wage base on your federal unemployment is $7,000. The effective rate for federal unemployment is 6%. If your state is solvent and not borrowing from the federal government, you get a 5.4% credit reduction. So then your effective rate becomes 6 tenths of a percent. I know. It's, they, nothing can be simple, right, everybody? So uh, essentially, if you're paying, your state is not borrowing, you get your full 5.4% credit reduction from the 6%, you pay 6 tenths of a percent, and your cost per worker is $42. But if you are borrowing, in a, if your state is borrowing for two consecutive years, you lose three-tenths of a credit. So in other words, instead of getting that 5.4% credit reduction, you'll only get 5.1, or you lose three-tenths of a percent, right? And now you're paying $63 per worker. California here, you can see that you've lost some credit reduction, you've lost um, nine tenths of a percent. So you paid on January third on January thirty first, two thousand and fourteen, a hundred and five dollars per worker instead of forty two dollars per worker because again California was borrowing. I do not anticipate that California is going to be able to pay back that ten billion dollars um, by September of this year because they have to, they would have to pay it off by September of this year. So I anticipate that um, it's going to be at 1.8%, your effective future rate, and it's going to be $126 per employee. So again, something's going to happen in um, California. Um, that taxable wage base is going to go up, or I anticipate something um, increase in those employer um, unemployment taxes. Okay, I'm just going to stop, pause real quick here before I get out into some other things um, and just see, I covered a lot about unemployment taxes there and just wanted to see if anybody had any questions and I'm going to kind of check our um, chat log here. Well, I don't see anything, so don't be shy. Feel free to type in a question. So the new legislation that um, passed in this uh, this last year was it, this Section 252 legislation. I want to give you some background about this and just kind of um, give you guys some information about why it's so important and why this legislation is so significant to our employers out there. So when we talk about two, Section 252, we're talking about this little piece of legislation that was slid in as a part of this, um, uh, this Trade Adjustment and Assistance Act, which really that trade adjustment had nothing to do with unemployment, but they slid this little piece of legislation uh, for unemployment in as a part of that act. And the need for this legislation was perceived because of the 2009-2010 recession. And as we just talked about, a number of the states and their reserve balances were insolvent. There was no money left to pay these benefits out to claimants, and they had just had to borrow money from the federal government to pay these loans. Um, 
when there is no money um, at the state level to pay unemployment benefits, they have to borrow the money, and the states want, and the federal government wanted to know why are the states in debt? Why are all these states borrowing money? Why are all these states insolvent? And they determined that the reason that all these states were insolvent and didn't have any uh, money was it was because it was the employer's fault, right? So now you're asking me, where, how in the world is it the employer's fault that the state doesn't have any money to pay unemployment benefits? Um, well, let me give you a classic example of, a, of, of an overpayment. So when you get an unemployment claim, the state is asking you, the EDD is asking you for separation information. Why is that employee no longer working for the organization or your organization? And they give you a due date. Right? And let's say you respond to the state agency with a pretty um, generic response, and you respond saying something like, this individual was discharged for a rule violation. But you don't give any details about that rule violation. You don't tell the state how was the employee violating the rule, what policy did they violate, did they receive any prior warnings regarding that policy, and you don't give the state any details. The state gets this one-line explanation that says claimant discharge rule violation. So obviously, you know, they may just very well pick up the phone and call you. We call these adjudicator calls, and they may pick up the phone and call you and ask for more details regarding that, um, that statement that you gave. If you don't return the call, if you don't provide additional information, chances are the state is going to rule in favor of the claimant, and the claimant's going to start receiving benefits. So when the claimant starts receiving benefits, um, they issue a decision to you. You get that decision that says, claimant's entitled to benefits. You fail to provide sufficient information, information to uh, give a disqualification. Therefore, the claimant is eligible. And now all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have this person on video surveillance walking out the back door with a computer in their arms. So you appeal that decision, and you go to an unemployment hearing, right? So you're at the unemployment hearing, and the administrative law judge at the EDD listens to your testimony now, listens to the claimant testimony, and they say, you know what, employer, you're right. This person is not entitled to unemployment benefits based on the reason for separation. However, had you provided us all this information at the initial level, we would have denied that person unemployment benefits. You have wasted our time now, and you have allowed this individual to collect benefits for six, eight weeks until the time that case is overturned. Presently, what is going on is in that scenario, the state has to immediately credit you back those benefits to your reserve balances. So if that individual collects I don't know, $1,000 in benefits, the state would immediately credit balance, balance um, with that $1,000. And now it is on the state to have to go back and try to collect that $1,000 back from the claimant or somebody who is out of work. Well, good luck with that, right? So if you show a pattern of that type of behavior where you're failing to provide sufficient and adequate information at the initial request for information, you may not get relief of charges if it is overturned at an unemployment hearing. And if you show a pattern of behavior, um, and if you show a pattern of behavior for that, um, they may not even allow you to go to an unemployment hearing. Some states, like Virginia, are actually fining you $75 for each unemployment claim um, over and above three in like a six-month period of time. Now, I will caution and say this. It is very subjective because each state has their own uh, policy, if you will, on what is considered a pattern of behavior. Um, Virginia is really the only one who said, like, in, within a six-month time period. So it's up to the state to determine what a pattern of behavior is. I would just say make sure you're giving the state everything, all documentation, all your information at the initial level. 
Um, all states had to pass this legislation. It was mandated by the federal government, and all states had to pass it by October 21st of each year, and they did. Um, and, and like, like I just talked about, I got a little ahead of myself there, so forgive me. If the employer or the employer's agent is the cause for the overpayment, then the employer or the employer's agent must be penalized for causing that overpayment. And the penalty is not getting relief of charges or not getting paid back that money to your reserve balance or not being able to um, participate in unemployment hearings. So that is the legislation um, that... Like, like I said, said just, just enacted, and, and I just, just want to make sure you're all aware of that. So, so I'm, I'm going to stop, stop and I see some questions um, um, in, the, in our chat log here, so let's see here. Um, Marie, where can I find my current unemployment tax rate? So Marie, um, your payroll department should have a copy of your rate notice that you receive from the EDD. So it's going to be on your rate notice from the EDD, you should have a copy of that. Um, and Laura, what if the details are confidential, say they were discharged for harassment or something similar? So we get this a lot, um, Laura. Um, if you have someone that was discharged for harassment um, of any kind, typically you always have a statement from the individual who was maybe being sexually harassed. Um, now, you can certainly send in that statement and redact the individual's name, but this is a very sensitive issue. What, I would, what we typically like to do here at Employers Edge, we work very closely with the employers group, and we represent a number of employers groups, um, customers um, with unemployment at the ED. Is we will certainly test the unemployment claim, indicate what had happened. This individual was discharged for sexual harassment. Specifically, this is what happened. But um, and, and I get, get it. it. Sometimes you just don't want to send in that um, that person's statement for fear of retribution to that, uh, that that individual who reported it. You, you certainly want to swing the bat. You certainly want to get in there and tell the state what happened. Um, just know it may be tough because you can't cross-examine a piece of paper, and that's the big thing with the state. They're looking for first-hand testimony. They're looking for statements from individuals that are signed and people that can attend unemployment here. But um, if, if you're going, going to provide a witness statement and redact, just know it's not going to hold a whole lot of weight, but nevertheless, um, the claimant would have to answer to it, you know, and say, did they get this, were they aware of it, of course they could deny it, but um, I, I, it, it, it is, that's a very sensitive area, especially when you have witness statements like that. Um, so, so this, this is just, again, again just kind of going on with, with the Section 252. Um, make sure you're providing supporting documentation to win at the initial level. Um, if, if you provide all docs and, and at the initial level, then there's no harm in appealing to an unemployment hearing. If you fail to provide all the documents at the initial level and you appeal it to a hearing and now, you have, now all of a sudden you have all this new evidence and all this new testimony you're wanting to add, just be prepared in that unemployment hearing. They may very well ask you, why did you fail to provide it initially? So, so you better, better be prepared, prepared to answer that, that, and that you know, and be prepared that you may not get relief of charges uh, for, for the period, period the individual may have been collecting. Um, and, and I've already talked to you, and I got a little ahead of myself, so I apologize here. Very by state, Virginia, like I said, are imposing fines. The most common penalty is the employer's account. Um, 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 that, that the benefits, benefits were paid out to the, claim, uh, to the claimant, you're, you're not going to get uh, relief of those charges. Um, and, and there's more severe penalties when you establish that pattern of behavior, such as, like I said, you may, may not even be able, able to ever appeal to an unemployment hearing. Okay, okay, so I'm done, done with Section 252. Let's, Let's talk about the base period. One of the questions I get asked most often is, you know, doggone it, Angie, that person worked for me over a year and a half ago. Why are you asking me for separation information? Well, this is the base period explanation. And understand, you guys, this was created in 1935, and it still holds true today in all jurisdictions, except for one, really, and that's Illinois. But I'm going to talk, in, you know, in general um, through all, all, uh, all the U.S. 
When, when you file for unemployment, unemployment benefits, benefits, you are given what is called a benefit year end date. It's, it's one year from the day you file for unemployment. So if you file for unemployment benefits today, your benefit year end date would be March 20th of 2015. That tells unemployment that Angie Hansen has one year to collect 26 weeks of benefits. Now that the state has determined what my benefit year is, they have to determine now who's going to pay for my unemployment benefits. And who's going to pay for my unemployment benefits is every employer in the base period. The base period is the first four of the last five completed. Completed calendar quarters. And that's kind of the key word here, completed calendar quarters. Right, right now, now, we're in the first quarter of 2014. So this quarter is, is not completed. completed. The state wants the five prior quarters, but they, they only want the first four of the five prior quarters. quarters. So, so essentially, you could have had somebody that quit in, in October of 2012, file for unemployment benefit today, and, and I'm going to get an unemployment claim, claim on that individual. That's, that's if you're a client, client of employer says, or you, you may get an unemployment, unemployment claim on that individual. individual. And you all, if, if you, you have a number of employers in that, that base period, every employer is going to get an unemployment claim, and we're all going to get an opportunity to tell the EDD why I'm no longer employed. Now, now, I will caution you in California, California again, California, California issues two unemployment claims, one to the last employers and one to the last or most recent employer you separated from. If somebody's been with you two, three years, you're not only the last or most recent employer, you're also the base period employer. So EDD would issue what we call the DE-1101, and I believe it's the DE-1545 or something very similar to that. So you may very well get two unemployment claims, and you have to respond to both of them. Even though you may have received, you're going to get the DE 1101 first, but you also need to respond to the DE 1545, which tells you your portion of the um, unemployment that you are responsible for. You have to respond to that one too. If you fail to, you'll lose protesting rights. So I just want to make sure those of you in California and are not with employer said that you're aware of that. So. Let me, Let me give you an example here. here. Let's say you have, have an employee that came on board in the fourth quarter of 2013. They, they came on board in November. November. You, you let, let them go today. They, they file for unemployment. You, you are going to get that DE-1101, right? But, but you are not a chargeable employer right, right now. Even, Even though, though you are not a chargeable employer and you're not getting that 1545, and forgive me, I'm not sure if I got the right number on that, but it's a, what we call a base period notice, um, um, you still want to respond to that DE-1101, even though you're not a chargeable employer, because if the individual files for benefits again one year, one day later, guess what? A new benefit year has just been established, and the wages in Q4 and Q1 of 2014 have now all shifted into a new base period, and then you become a chargeable employer. This is also why it's so important for you to keep great records on why someone left. If someone um, left and they were only with you in six weeks, seven weeks, something like that, and um, you get that unemployment claim and you're scratching your head and it's kind of like, geez, I kind of remember that guy. I think he worked for me in you know, the shops and, geez, did he walk off the job? What happened? You need to make sure that you are... Uh, that you have all the detailed information because, again, it goes back to that Section 252 legislation, failing to provide adequate or sufficient information, you could lose protesting rights. So um, just make sure you're always keeping great records on each and every employee and, and why they are no longer with you. So, again, we we'll to stop real quick here and just see any questions out here. So, so this, this is a great, great question. question. Thank, Thank you, Conrad. Conrad. Um, 
Are, are there, there any legal ramifications to agree to, to not contest an unemployment claim with a specific employee as part of a separation agreement? agreement. There, there are no legal, legal ramifications, but um, well, there may be. I will tell you this. You can, you can never tell the individual that, um, we're, I mean, listen, you go away quietly and we won't contest your unemployment. By not contesting their unemployment, it doesn't automatically mean they're going to get unemployment benefits. Um, the, the ECD, ECD makes, makes that, that final determination. determination. They, they don't, don't like employers making the, the, that, that decision on whether or not someone's eligible or not eligible. You, you can decide not to respond to an unemployment claim, claim and the EDD will, will, will still call you potentially and, and still ask for separation information. information. You, you don't have to respond to that, that claim, but please know, and, and I will tell you this happens more often than I have to bring it up because, because it, it happens, happens a lot, lot. Um, the, the claimants sometimes talk themselves out of the, of the unemployment claim. So the EDD starts questioning them, and the, the claimant says, yeah, well, you know, I could have tried a little bit harder, and yeah, I probably could have done a little bit better. Yeah, it was my fault. And then the EDD says, you're not eligible. So then what happens is the claimant comes back to you and says, you said you wouldn't contest. You didn't contest the unemployment claim. So you never really want to say that, um, we're, we're going to go ahead and allow, you know, know we're, we're going to go ahead and allow, allow if you, you go ahead and quit, quit go, go away quietly, we, we won't contest your unemployment. Just make, make sure you're telling, telling them we don't, don't make the final determination. determination. It's up to the EDD to determine whether or not you're eligible for benefits. Um, I, see I see another one. one. Okay, okay, so Kendra, Kendra has a question, question here, here, and she, she says, says, if we employ someone for one, one and a half years, and we are responsible for the base period, and they voluntarily resign for another job, and then six weeks later are let like go from that job, will, will um Will, will be then still, will, will we be still be charged, charged with, with no opportunity to appeal because they work for us and we are in the base period. period. No, no, you still have base period rights as, as long as, as you're a. a um, I'm, I'm assuming, assuming you're a for-profit for profit employer because for, for the not-for-profit not world, there's a whole other set of rules. I'm assuming you're a for-profit employer, but if someone quit, let's say Q4 2012, went on to another employer, worked a few weeks, got laid off, went on somewhere else. You still, still want to respond to that claim and you want to say, this, this person, person voluntarily quit for another, another job, continued work was available, and, and then attach the maybe a copy of the resignation letter. And, and send that in, in on, on that DE 1545 into, into the EDD. So, so hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. So, so um, you, you, you could put, put, be, be chargeable, so you, so you certainly want to respond to that, um, that 1545 notice that you got from the EDD. Okay. okay. This, this is, is a nice flow of, of the unemployment claim, claim. and this, this is, is going to give you an idea of how employers' edge interacts with, with um, 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 some, some of our employers group customers, because um, uh, a number of uh, customers of employers group utilize, utilize our services to process their unemployment claims. claims. So, so I just, just want to give you an example of how we interact with that, that and, and how we process claims on, on, on the, their, their behalf. behalf. We, we, employer's Edge becomes the agent or the address of record with, with the EDD. And, and what that means is the unemployment claim, then, so should someone file for benefits, would come, come directly to Employer's Edge for, for processing. So, so no, no longer is, is it going to be, you know, you know sometimes, sometimes big organizations just don't, don't know where, where those unemployment claims are going. Um, but, but they, they would come to Employer's Edge, edge they go to my mail room, after the individual quits, discharge lack of work, of course, they can file file for benefits, benefits online, they, they can, can do it over the, the phone, they, they can do it in person. person. It's, it's not, not going to age myself a little here, here but it's, it's not, not like the 80s where, where there was basically an unemployment office on every corner in every town in USA. USA. So um, typically, typically if you're going to file in person, the EDD sits you down in front of a computer and you file online and you're going to go down to one of the offices. So. Um, there's, there's a separation, separation that has happened. happened. Um, they, they filed for benefits. benefits. The, the, uh, the EDD, EDD then punches in that, that social security, security number and they say, oh, look at there, this person works for employers, employers group or, or in care of employers, employers edge. edge. That, that unemployment, unemployment claim then is sent to employers, employers edge here in Denver, Colorado. Colorado. 
Um, the unemployment claim comes into my mail room. room. That claim is then scanned and imaged in my mail room. room. It, it then gets pushed to what we call a claim specialist and their work in progress screen or whip screen. Get it? Clever, right? Work in progress whip. And then it's dated because you know what I know. Everything you do for unemployment is deadline driven. If you miss a due date, if you miss a deadline, you've lost protesting rights. The, the states, states have, have no tolerance for asking, asking for extensions, extension, nor will they give you extensions. Extension. And, and please know where the states, states are coming, coming from, from, why, why their, their deadlines are so strict. strict. The, the, the unemployment, unemployment was created for the out-of-work out worker. Um, and, 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 and the individual, individual is assumed to be eligible for benefits unless told and proved otherwise. So, so the, the states feel, feel like you, the employer, employer by not, not responding timely or with, with enough, enough information, you are, you are holding, holding up someone's right to unemployment benefits who truly may deserve those benefits. benefits. So, so be mindful of your due dates. Date. And, and I, I will tell you, um, if you are a customer of Employer's Edge and you're working with an Employer's Group and Employer's Edge, you know we're a little naggy. We're a little naggy about making sure reaching out to you, getting that separation information. So after after we date it, it we, we email, email our customer, uh, the client, and say, hey, we have an unemployment claim. claim. This, this is a due date. date. I, need I need these facts. facts. What happened? Um, why, why is this individual no longer employed? employed? And, and typically, we're always looking for the final incident, incident. Because, because everything on an, an involuntary termination centers around the final incident. incident. When, when did you, as an employer, employer say, that's it, I'm done? I no, I no longer, longer want you as an employee. And, and um, we, need we need to write, write that up. We need to send that final incident information to the EDD on what happened. And then, and then the EDD wants to know whether there are any warnings that relate to that final incident. And, and we'd like to frame our protest. That's what we like to say. We'd like to, to frame our protest to the EDD as well as all state agencies in a way that gives them the easiest access to the information and the facts and the details. And typically they want to know what was the final incident. Then they want to know the dates of the final incident. They want it in reverse chronological order. They, they want, want all the attachments to be labeled appropriately, 1A, 1B, 1C, etc. And, and we send all that information, information into, the, to the, to the, to the state. state. The state takes a look at what we said. They can take a look at what the claimant says. And they, and they make, make a decision. That, that decision is favorable or unfavorable. If it's, if it's favorable, favorable, it means you win. Claimant is denied unemployment. If it's, if it's unfavorable, you, you lost. lost. Claimant, claimant will be receiving benefits. benefits. Through, Through due, due process, either party has the right to appeal that, that and, and then you go to an unemployment, unemployment hearing. If, if you are with, with Employer's Edge, edge um, we, we will appeal, appeal that on your, on your behalf. behalf. We'll, we'll send, send the request, request into the state agency. The state, state agency then, then issues a hearing notice. notice. Again, that hearing notice comes, comes to Employer's Edge. It, it goes to my mailroom. It, it is scanned and imaged in my mailroom. And, and then it is put to a claim, claim specialist. I'm sorry, sorry your appellate group's work, work in progress train. Now, that would be right? right? Within, Within 24 hours after we get that hearing notice, we push that hearing notice out to our contacts um, at, at the employer. employer. Now, now um, I, I want, to, if, if, again, again, if you are with, with Employer's Edge, Edge you, you have, have a representative from Employer's Edge, Edge that attends these unemployment, unemployment hearings with, with you. Um, um, at the EDD, you, you know and I know, they, they love in-person hearings. hearings. I, don't I don't know what, what it is about, about the two coasts. coasts. But, but in, in um, California, they love in-person in hearings. hearings. On, on the East Coast, Coast you know, New York, York Pennsylvania, um, D.C., Connecticut, they also like in-person like in -person hearings, hearings too. too. But all, all, all of us kind of in the, in the middle, middle, it's usually done, done right over the telephone. The telephone. Uh, uh, so, so we would push, push that hearing notice to your, your inboxes. And then, and then a couple of days later, we would assign a hearing rep who would work with you to get you prepped and ready for that unemployment hearing. It doesn't mean that you don't, don't have, have to attend, attend. You, still you still have, have to, to attend, attend that, that hearing. hearing. And, we're and we're looking for the, for the person, person with the most first-hand knowledge to attend. attend. If, 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 if I go without, without the person with the, with the most first-hand first knowledge, such as their supervisor or maybe, or maybe an HR representative who sat down with the individual, got the resignation letter, if I go with just 
some, some, you know, you know, someone, someone who doesn't, doesn't have first-hand first knowledge, the state, the state may rule that as hearsay testimony, testimony especially if the claimant is there to give first-hand testimony. testimony. So, so the hearing officer listened to the, the claimant testimony, the employer testimony, and again, they will make a decision. That, that decision is favorable or unfavorable. If it's, if it's still, still unfavorable, that the third and final level in, in the unemployment, unemployment process is the Board of Review. review. Now, now, the, the board, board of Review is on the salary of the unemployment, unemployment department, and, and their, their job is to make sure that the hearing officer was a sound mind and body when he or she made, she made their decision. decision. Did, Did they take into account, account all the witness testimony? Did they, Did they apply the law correctly? If, if we feel, and Board of Ed feels, those, those things, things didn't, didn't happen, happen, we will, we will recommend, recommend an appeal, appeal to the board. board. Now, now, I will caution you here. The board, getting, getting something overturned, overturned by the board is pretty, pretty minimal. I just, I just, I just don't, don't think the board likes overturning their, their hearing officers. officers. Typically, what they'll do, they'll, they'll remand it back to the hearing officer to allow testimony or reopen the case to listen to, to um, testimony, testimony that maybe they didn't allow, allow. And, you and you get to do that process all over, over again. The, the Board of Review doesn't, doesn't usually overturn. I, I, would I would say if they overturn, it is probably less than 2% of the time, time that they would actually overturn one of, one of their hearing officers. officers. Typically what they do is usually remand it. But, but I just wanted you to have the flow, flow of, the of the unemployment, so there's three levels, levels the claim level, the hearing, hearing level, and, and the Board of Review. Oh, there's, there's three, three types of separations that are adjudicated, and the first thing the unemployment, unemployment department always asks is, is what was continuing work available? available? Now, now, depending on how you answer, answer that question, that determines who is, who is the moving party in the, in the separation. separation. Was, was continuing work available? And the answer is yes. Then the, the unemployment department knows that, that, knows that it was a voluntary quit, quit and... and the employee has, has the burden of proof and, and must show good cause why, why they quit. If, if the answer to that question is no, then, then the state, state knows that, that you were either, you were either, either fired, fired or discharged or, or it was a lack of work claim. claim. Another, Another falsehood we hear, hear is if, if I quit, quit I, cannot I cannot collect unemployment, unemployment but, if but if I'm fired, fired I can. I can. Well, this, well, this is false because, because, uh, uh, false because, because if you quit, quit for, for good, good cause, and I'm going to get into examples of what good cause is, the state, the state may very well determine, determine that you are eligible, eligible for, for unemployment, unemployment benefits. benefits. If, if you're, you're fired, fired, you can collect. collect. Again, Again, that's false. If, if you, you can, can prove to the, to the unemployment department that that, that individual was discharged for misconduct, in other words, a deliberate and willful Disregard for the employer's best interest, best interest that, that individual would be denied, denied unemployment. unemployment. So, so here's a, a checklist for you to be mindful of, of and, just and just remember when you're responding to the EDD or, or discharging or writing up your, your employees. employees. Make sure you're detailing the rule of policy that was violated. And make, and make sure, sure you know about the final incident. incident. I cannot stress to you enough, enough how important this, this final incident is to the, the unemployment agencies. agencies. Again, Again, what, what happened, happened on the final day that caused, that caused the individual to be separated from, from your employment? How did, if, if, they were, if, they if they violated, violated the rule, how, how did they know about the rule? The rule? Did, did they, they sign, sign an employee, employee handbook? Do you, do you have proof of that? that? Did, did you know, they acknowledge the page from the employee handbook? handbook? Um, did, did you coach, coach them? them? I, will I will also tell you, you unemployment expects you to, to give, give the employee every, every opportunity, opportunity to improve the behavior unless it's gross misconduct. Someone comes in and punches you in the face, that's probably gross misconduct. But, but the, 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 um, you, know, you know, outside, outside of that, that, the state wants, wants you to give that employee every, every opportunity to improve. To improve. If, if you discharge without, without the opportunity to improve, you better be prepared to tell unemployment why you, why you did that. that. What, was what was the harm in not, in not giving, giving them that opportunity to improve? Um, how was, How was the claimant made aware of the expectations? Did you, you offer to retrain them? Did you retrain them? them? 
indicate how the claimant knew their job was in jeopardy. So there's three parts to a warning, right? The violation, the expected action, how to improve, and the consequences. I will give you an example. Back in the day when I was doing hearings, I had an employer that I was representing, and they had written up this individual a couple of times for a violation, and I was entering those warnings into evidence. And, um, and um, I was, was cross-examining the claimant about, about those warnings. warnings. He, he agreed that he had gotten those warnings, but he went on to say, yeah, I've got those warnings, but I, but I didn't know I could be fired for it. Now, now whether, whether or not that, that was statement, statement was true or not, I don't know. know. But, the, but the, fact the fact is the employer felt to put that little tagline line on the bottom of that warning that said, further violation of this policy may result in additional disciplinary action up to and, and including termination. So, so make, make sure, sure they know their, their jobs in jeopardy if they, they continue with the behavior. behavior. And then, and then establish, establish that the rule violates protects your business interests and is applied fairly and consistently. And again, if employees are talking to one another, if you have an employee or supervisor in one department who really is pretty lackadaisical about writing people up about being tardy, and you've got a supervisor in the next department over who's um, always writing them up, very... Um, you know, you know uh, make, making sure, sure that people are on, to, work to work on time, time and that, I'm, you, know, you know, and eventually somebody gets fired from that, that supervisor, I'm going to end, end up in an unemployment, unemployment hearing explaining, if, you're, if, if I'm representing you, explaining that why it was okay for one supervisor, one supervisor in one department um, not, not to write people, people up and allow them to be five, five ten minutes late, late in this other department, department um, this, this person was being written up. up. Nothing, Nothing will make us lose an unemployment, an unemployment claim faster than, than if you're not even following your own progressive discipline at your, at your organization. Now, now after, after a voluntary quit, quit the, the burden of proof, proof is the responsibility of the claimant. And the claimant has to show a, a serious, compelling reason. I'll give you some examples of a compelling reason. reason. They had no, no alternative but to quit their job, and they, and they did everything they, they could to protect it before um, they, they quit. quit. So, so some, some um, good, good co cause, compelling, compelling reasons are, are obviously, you have, you have to have working toilets, toilets you, know, you, know, you, know, you know. If, 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 you, don't if you don't have, have, if you have poor working conditions, conditions and, and that, 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 that may be considered a good cause. cause. Substantial drop in wages or benefits may be considered, considered good cause. cause. Right, right now, we're kind of seeing around the 20% mark, a drop in wages, drop in benefits. Believe it or not. That, that, they were looking at that as good cause. cause. Um, um, obviously, obviously, you, you want to fight those as much as you can. can. To, to follow a spouse who's in the military, who's been, been transferred, that's, that's a good cause. cause. So, there's, so there's, those, those are some good cause compelling reasons. Reason. Also, also, if your doctor says, says hey, your, your job's giving you migraines, you need to quit, quit. That's, that's a good cause. cause. So, so if they have a doctor that's telling them, that's another example of a good cause compelling reason. So I want to talk a little bit about hearings here, too. Um, unemployment, unemployment hearing does not have all the formalities of a court of law, but you are sworn to tell the truth. And nothing upsets the hearing officer more than if you're fumbling through your paperwork looking for these first five questions here. Um, so, so make sure, sure that, that you always, always have, have these first five, five questions, questions, guys, go look at these split, you know. You know? So, so dates, dates of employment, their rate, rate of pay, their job, job description or job title, were they full-time or part-time, and, and then the reason for separation. separation. And they'll say, quick, quick discharge, discharge, lack of work, work. discharge. And, and then you get into the merits of the case. And typically, the adjudicator at the state will ask you, what was the final incident? What was, what the, was final the final incident? incident? And, again, and again, they want, did they, did they get warnings that relate to the final incident? incident. And, and I will caution you here, your, 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 your warnings must, must relate, relate to the final incident. incident. If, your if your final incident was, was um, a, a safety, safety issue, issue but, all but all your warnings relate, relate to attendance, attendance we're gonna, we're gonna, you're going to have a tough time proving misconduct because, because again, again um, the, state the state will think that you discharge without the opportunity to improve. To improve. So, so your, your, your warnings, warnings need to relate to the, to the final incident. incident. 
Make, make sure, sure you have, have a signed, signed resignation for, for your voluntary quit, quit if, if you, you can get, get it. it. Documentation, Documentation for your written, written warning and, and that detail about, about that final, final incident. incident. So, so I'm just going to see here, I see a question has come, come in. So, so how should we handle simultaneously disability and, and unemployment, unemployment claims? First, First of all, if, if someone is on disability and they, and they file an unemployment claim, claim you, you absolutely want to tell the DDD that, that this person is on disability. You have, you have to be, to be able, able, available, available, you have to be able and available for work. All right. All right. If, if they, they are on disability, they're, they're obviously not able and available for work. So you may make, make sure you respond to the EDD that that, that individual, individual is on disability or work comp. They need, they need, they they need, they need to, know to know that. that. Can, um, Laura, Laura, Laura says, can a resignation letter be an email, or does it have to be a signed, signed letter? An email, an email is fine. fine. Send, Send it in. Attach, attach it with your response to the EDD. Absolutely. It sure, it sure can. So, so here's some um, cost control suggestions for you. Make, make sure you're using um, uh, proper, proper hiring practices to reduce your turnover. Any, any kind of testing you can do on the very, on the very beginning. Um, we, 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 test, test, we test our, claim our claims specialists, specialists and all that before, before they're hired, hired on. on. You know, you know and, um, for, for our, our jobs, you have to love a deadline, and you've you got to be able to um, articulate, articulate, boy, I can't talk, articulate a response to the unemployment state agencies when you're protesting. And an unemployment, unemployment claim, so we, we, we test people on that, on that type of thing. thing. Make, Make sure, sure you're performing job evaluations on a regular basis. basis. If, if you're letting, letting someone, someone go for poor, poor performance, performance, remember, remember this. this. Lack, Lack of talent, talent is, is not misconduct. If, if you, you hired someone, someone and, they and they came on board, board tried their hardest, hardest, maybe they, they didn't, didn't, but they, but they never reached, reached that level you need them to perform at, at. That's, that's not, not misconduct. The state, the state looks at that as a bad, bad hiring decision. decision. And, and frankly, frankly, you know, you know utilize, utilize your, your probationary, probationary period, period to minimize that, that, that exposure to those, to those unemployment costs. costs. Make, make sure, sure each employee, employee gets, gets your work rules, rules and, your and your code of conduct, and make sure, and make sure you're getting those examples. If you, if you can, can do exit interviews, interviews with, them, with them, make, make sure, sure you're getting some sort of resignation letter. letter. Because, because what may happen, happen is, and that, and that one question, question that we had from, from um, um, let's, let's see here. here. From, from Kendra, Kendra about somebody, somebody leaving a year and a half ago. ago. So, so if somebody left a year ago, goes, goes on to the, the next job, job files for unemployment, of course, of course we can, can test the claim or you can test the claim, test the claim. they voluntarily quit. quit. Now, now the person is finding, finding out that they may, they may not get all their unemployment because the, the wage is reported by you, it's not going to be in their calculation for their benefits. Well, that sometimes seems to coming out of the claimant's mouth, mouth that we thought we'd never hear. hear. Because, because you, they, they may say something like, well, you, well, you know, that Angie Hampson, Hampson she, was she was so mean to me, yelling at me, picking, picking on me in front of everybody. I was abused and harassed. I had no choice but to quit. And then you're back cuddling, going, where did that come from? And so that's why resignation letters or emails or exit, or exit interviews, interviews can, can be to your, to your benefit, benefit because, because you can use that, that in an unemployment hearing and say, listen, um, you didn't say anything, anything about being harassed or abused in your, in your email. email. Who, did Who did you talk to? to? Who did you go to? We have an open door policy. I had no idea that, that happened. happened. So, 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 you know, exit, exit interviews, interviews, resignation letters, emails, emails very, very key, key in, in, uh, on, the on the voluntary quits. Quit. Make, Make sure, sure you're documenting all your warnings, warnings and coaching, whether it's verbal or written. Or written. If, you're, if, you're, if you're just talking to somebody about, you know, I really need you here at 8, 8, 8 o'clock in the morning. morning. You, need you need to make sure, sure you have your coffee, coffee you're at your desk, your computer turned, turned on, and you're working at 8. You know, document that. You know, even though it wasn't formal, just make sure you're documenting that. Because, again, you can use that that you talk to them about that behavior. If they're, if they're turning, turning down, down work, work, turning, turning down, down shifts, shifts. You want, you want, and they're collecting unemployment benefits, so you've got somebody working for you, working, working less than a full-time schedule, schedule. Yes, yes, they can collect partial, partial benefits. benefits. Does, Does it make up for the full amount, amount between, between working, working part-time part -time and working full-time? Full -time. You know, there, there may be a small amount they can collect, but if they're collecting partial unemployment and they're turning down shifts for work and you're offering them suitable work, you want to report that to the EDD. And then make sure you're protesting your unemployment claim. Because like I said, something's going to happen in California. Yeah. They're, going they're going to have to increase that taxable wage base. They're going to have, have to increase employer taxes. taxes. And, and you need you to, need to take, take a look now at where you're at on your, on your um, 
uh, your tax, tax rate, rate and just, and just make sure, sure your um, um, protesting, protesting these unemployment, unemployment claims, claims and protecting your reserve, reserve balances as, as much as possible. possible. Okay. okay. Well, you guys, you guys it's, it's almost the top, top of the hour. hour. I, know I know I went really, really fast, fast on that, that but we've come, we've come to, the to the end of the presentation. presentation. And um, if, if you'd like to type, type in another, another question, question, or if, if you do, do um, okay, okay, let's, let's take, take a look here. here. What if you let them go for a tenant fast body? A tenant issue can be a very difficult claim to win, and I will tell you that. But let's just start here. A sick, a sick call or your, or your kids, kids are sick is not, not considered, considered misconduct. misconduct. Regardless, Regardless of how many warnings, warnings you've given them, them how many opportunities to improve, the state simply asks the question, what would a reasonable and prudent person do if they're sick? What would a reasonable and prudent person do if their kids are sick? And the, and the answer, answer to that question is um, they, they stay, stay home. home. Even, Even on, on that last morning, morning that, that last morning, morning they said, hey, you're, you're calling, calling sick one more time, time in the next six days, days i got to let you go. go. And you let, and you let them, them go, and they file for unemployment, it's going to be a tough unemployment claim to win. So, so if you have some flexibility there, that's great. great. Make sure, Make sure you're documenting every reason for every tardiness and, and for every absenteeism. Um, so make sure you're documenting that because that may come up um, in the, in the, uh, in the um, unemployment hearing or for that unemployment claim. So, so what about mutual, mutual separations? separations? So, so a mutual, mutual separation, so it's, so it's just like, like listen, listen, it's not working, working out for us. For us. Bottom, Bottom line is that's considered a discharge. discharge. So, so if you're, you're sitting, sitting down with that individual and you're, and you're saying, saying listen, so you, so you don't, don't have, have to have a resignation, resignation on your personal um, resume or whatever. Um, um, they ask, what, what, remember, remember that question, was, was continuing work available? And, and the answer, the answer to that, that question is going to be no. no. So, so the employer, the employer has, has the burden of proof, and you, and you would have, have to prove to the CDP or the unemployment department why you, why you discharge, discharge that individual. That individual. So, so it is an employer. Um, yeah, yeah, if the employer, employer has, has the burden of proof. Burden of proof. So, so Kendra asked, asked if someone resigned, resigned to relocate, relocate out of the area, area or out, out of the state with, with the spouse, the spouse they will they receive benefits? benefits. Yes. Yes. That is, that is a good, good cause, cause compelling, compelling reason. reason. In, in, in some states, states it, is it is considered a win-win, meaning, meaning the claimant, the claimant gets, gets their benefits, benefits and, and the benefits are paid from, from the state's, the state's, um, from the from the state's, state's fund, fund and not, and not from, from an, an individual, individual employer, employer fund. fund. In, in some, some states, states um, it, 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 it would be your charge. charge. So, so each state, state is going to be a little different. different. So, so if it's a good, good cause, cause compelling, compelling reason like that, that you, you may, may be charged for it or may be considered a win-win. Depends on the state. So, so um, um, I don't, I don't see, see any, any more questions, questions and, and hopefully I answered answer them all. If, if you, you do have any more questions, questions please email, email Darlene, or you, or you can email Steve, Steve here, and they'll, they'll make sure it gets to the right person, person. Um, and, we'll and we'll certainly, certainly answer, answer your questions for you. For you. But, but um, you, can um, you can email, email Darlene, Darlene Huntington at... at um, Okay, I see another question coming in. What if I had a couple of typing in, so... Well, right, well, right now I don't see him typing right now, but we'll still, still leave the line open. We'll still keep the questions, questions coming. Okay. Okay. So, so, so Kathy, Kathy Webb, Webb says, says, what if an employee, employee quits, quits to look for another, another job with more flexible, flexible hours to allow, to allow for school? school. You, would you would want, want to come. Um, they, they can apply, apply for unemployment. unemployment. Um, you, would um, you would want to contest, contest that claim. claim. You, have you have hours available. Claim claim it voluntarily quit. And you would want to also tell the state, Question, question their able, able and availability for work. For work. Because, because if they're if going, going to school, school you know, you know and, and um, they're, they're going, going to school and they're looking, looking they, they quit their job. The state may, California may rule that they are eligible because they had good costs, because they're looking for a job with more flexible hours. I will tell you, in California, you have a lot of hurdles here. But you would certainly want to contest what we call a secondary issue, an able and available issue. Um, but, um, but I would certainly, certainly contest that on the claim and make, make sure the EDD knows, EDD knows you, have you have work available, available you, are you are willing maybe to accommodate those, those hours, not all, not all of them, but you could accommodate some of them, and just, and just make sure the EDD, EDD is aware of that. Of that. 
So, so then Conrad, Conrad says here, here I've received spontaneous uh, unemployment, unemployment claims from multiple states. states. Are, there are there legitimate, legitimate reasons for this, for this to happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, if so if somebody was working, working for you in California, California and then moves to Arizona, to Arizona but, they but they file for benefits, for benefits in Arizona, in Arizona you may very well get an unemployment claim from Arizona as well as California. So make sure I make sure you're responding to both. Typically, Arizona, if all the wages were paid in California, they will. Um, bill, bill, if, if you will, will California, California for, for any benefit, benefit paid, paid for the claimant. And we do, and have, we do have one other question. Uh, who can I email call, call directly about some questions? A company is moving to another state, state in about one, one year, and I want, and I want to understand at what point would you be better to be staffing services to refill positions to reduce major UI claims and layoffs? Um, we do um, have a helpline if you are a member of an employer's group. Um, we do handle a lot of kind of UI questions as well. Um, I know one person in particular has been doing a lot of UI questions in this kind of area. Um, please feel free to reach out to any of our helpline consultants. They also have you know, expertise in uh, some UI questions as well. Okay, okay good. And, and Janet, Janet, real quickly here, here they can, they can and, um, and the, DC the DC and Virginia, Virginia question, question. Janet, Janet, they can, they can file, file in any state, state they, want they want to. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. It doesn't matter. So, so um, the states, the states have, an have an agreement with one another where they'll bill each, each other for benefits, for benefits um, depending, um, depending on where wages were reported. So do you see that? Somebody wants to know what the helpline number is. Exactly, exactly what I did for, for is to answer the questions, questions you might have, whether it is EY, whether, whether it is workers' comp, whether it is FMLA, any topic whatsoever. Topic whatsoever. You, get you get down limited, you know, a member of employers group, you get down limited access. You can call in as many times as you want. You can, you can uh, uh, talk, talk to them for as long as you need to. There's no limit to that until you get the answer that you need. Great. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Have a fabulous weekend. And, and um, please, um, please reach, reach out, out to the employer's group, group if you need, if you need anything. anything. And thank and you, thank so, you much so much, Angie, for being able to join us. Like, like you mentioned at the start of today's webinar, uh, you will be receiving a copy of today's presentation along with the HRCI, HRCI credit. credit. Um, if you do if you have any questions, questions, please feel free to reach out to the employer's group. We'd be more than happy to help out. And thank everyone for being able to join us. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.